if x and y are analytic vector fields, one defines the Lie bracket of x and y denoted bracket x y as the vector field bracket x y at a point p m is the analytic manifold p in m applied to f is x p applied to y f plus minus y p like this x and f x and y are vector fields on m so this this is the function x f is the function q going to x q x at q on f <clears throat> so you get a function x f on which of course you can apply the vector vector tangent vector y p and similarly x p is the tangent vector defined by x at p so this of course one has to check this is a vector field in other words you have to check that this is a derivation that this satisfies the condition for tangent vector namely the right hand side defines a tangent vector which associates to each f this element <clears throat> so bracket x y is this vector field and then if it's easy to check i mean in, in local in a local chart If x is of the form sigma ai d by dx i, where a are analytic functions, and y is of the form sigma vi d by dx i, you find that bracket x y equals sigma ai <coughs> d vi by d, yeah, d bj by dx i d by dx j minus sigma v i d a j by dx j got it right d b i So that is the from this it's obvious that if I xyp at p is this expression, which is obviously a tangent vector at the point p. So it's clear that this bracket x y is the vector field. And this operation x y going to bracket x y makes the set of all analytic vector fields on M into a Lie algebra over R. Now, we have the bracket Y satisfies the following conditions. One, this bilinear <coughs> lambda x plus u x prime bracket psi x psi y plus eta y prime equals lambda psi x y plus lambda eta x y prime plus mu psi x prime y plus mu eta x prime y prime. 
that is bilinearity with respect to reals and secondly if x, y, z are vector fields we have the following identity x, y bracket z plus y, z bracket x plus <coughs> z, x bracket y is 0. So, that is what it means to say that this set of all vector fields under this bracket operation is the linear algebra. Oh, I forgot most important x x is 0, which is same thing as for every pair of x y. So, this should have come first. <coughs> So, a vector space with an operation which you call bracket satisfying these three conditions is a Lie algebra. So, in particular the set of all vector fields is a Lie algebra over R. Notice that actually the set of all vector fields forms a module over all functions, all analytic functions because if you have X as a vector field. one defines f x as the vector field by simply looking at f p x p. <coughs> so, this, this shows that you can multiply vector fields by function to get a vector field which means set of vector fields vector fields is a module over the set of over the ring of analytic functions on M. However, the bracket operation is not bilinear over AM, it is only bilinear over R, but not over AM, it is not bilinear over AM. So, it is not a real algebra over AM, it is only a real algebra over real numbers, not over the algebra of analytic functions. So, that is the set of all vector fields become a real algebra. And last time we saw that we can associate a vector field, a local one parameter group of local analytic diffeomorphisms. to a vector field on associates vector field on M on any compact on any relatively compact open set K A one parameter group, a local one parameter group of local analytic diffeomorphisms, which means map phi t defined, or rather phi from. set mod t less than delta in the real line <coughs> cross k m satisfying phi t plus 6 phi t of phi s x for t s in delta, sorry, mod t mod s 
what we possess less than delta and phi s x x in k phi s x is also in k. But I should have before this I should have put earlier condition that phi 0 x equals x. Because of this we know that uh, if this this phi is analytic so and continuous therefore so since phi 0 x equals x you know that phi t x will also be inside k, k is an open set for, for small values of t. <coughs> so and then you have the condition that for every f analytic at x in k which means in a neighborhood of x in k f d by dt of f composed with f of phi dx t equals 0 is the this how related to the vector field did I give a name for the vector field to a vector field x I should to indicate dependence on x I will have to x everywhere s of x x. So phi x dx at t equals 0 is precisely x at the point x applied to f. So this there exists such an analytic map phi x from what t cross delta cross k into m mod t less than delta cross k into m satisfying these conditions. And moreover phi x t is unique uniquely determined. Now this is close connection between this one parameter group and the bracket operation and that is before saying that let me also point out something here. is this let me state a lemma. The one parameter group local one parameter group d by dx i in an open set omega of r n is the map phi p x equals x plus t e i where e 1 e 2 n is a standard basis of R n. Usual standard ordered basis ith coordinate is E i is such that it is <coughs> its ith coordinate is uh, 1 all other coordinates are 0. Okay, then this is the one parameter group of that which is very easily checked and notice that uh, if I am taking an open set this is not defined for all t it will be limited to some t such that x plus t still belongs to this omega if I want to define it in omega. Okay, this is a easy lemma and a corollary which is a consequence of the inverse function theorem is this if x is a vector field on m with x p not equal to 0 for p in m then there exists a chart coordinate chart u f containing u containing p such that x in this chart is nothing but d by dx1. The moment the tangent vector the vector field is such that the tangent vector at some point is not 0 in a neighborhood the vector field can be 
thought of as d by dx1 for a suitable coordinate chart. And the proof is quite easy, it goes like this, you look at fix, the point p is fixed, p fixed and let, and think of it as p is in now open set in Rn, pick a linear subspace of Rn, say E of Rn of co dimension 1, 1 dimension less such that think of this xp, xp is after all a tangent vector so it is a linear combination sigma i i d by dx i in the coordinate system such that r x p plus direct sum of e is of r n. That is I think of this x p itself as a vector in the nuclear space and take a supplementary co-dimension 1 subspace which I call e. Then look at the map, consider the map. T y going to phi t y in e, y neighborhood of 0, I am assuming that uh, we will assume that p is, that is there is no loss of generality and assume that p is 0. All the coordinates of P are all 0. If, if it is not, you simply translate suitably and make the coordinates 0. So, you look at this map Ty to phi T 0 y and then apply the inverse function theorem to this. You can easily check that the tangent map is the identity and then you find therefore that you, you get a diffeomorphism between T varying between say within delta of origin cross y in a lower dimensional Euclidean space n minus 1 that from open set to Rn to that becomes a diffeomorphism and therefore it is inverse if you take. In that inverse it is a new coordinate system and the vector field becomes d by dx by the this condition d by dx1. This makes the first coordinate and the rest of them are x, y if you like is x2 etc. etc. <coughs> so that is a uh, interesting corollary and a corollary to the corollary is the following. See if let me first point out something x a vector field on M suppose capital F from M to M is an analytic diffeomorphism. That is an analytic map whose inverse is also analytic, whose inverse exists is one to one onto map analytic and the inverse is also analytic. Suppose such a thing is there, x a vector field on M, then you can define a vector field. on n as follows. What I do is you take a point P in M and define set x at f of P, this is a new vector, x is the original vector field, define get a new vector field say y, y at f P is nothing but d f at P applied to x P. x P is the tangent vector at the point P there is the differential map df. If you have an analytic map, your corresponding differential map which takes a tangent space to tangent space. So, I define y of fp as dfp of xp. And this is, uh, we will define a vector field on all, all of n because this mapping is 1 to 1 and on 2. So, for each fp, there is only 1p. So, this is well defined. There is 1p and there is only 1. So, this is the y is the image under df of x. <coughs> now, 
with this these definitions now i will also yeah now look at suppose x y are vector fields then another lemma then <coughs> bracket x y equals d by d t of d phi t of y now d phi t y <coughs> d phi t is differential so d phi t y will be a tangent vector at a nearby point t t being near zero is going to be tangent vector for a nearby point and then phi t star d phi t y makes sense and then you get a vector field as a fixed fixed t here you get a vector field this vector field will also be defined at the point original point p so the claim is this d by dt d d phi t d phi t of y is a vector field and that i have evaluated at the point p that's what i mean d phi t y i should say this is always this is all the time a tangent vector at the point p so it's in a fixed vector space d phi t y p makes sense so d by dt of that makes sense and at t equals 0 that is precisely bracket x y p okay and so you can calculate the of course you can reverse the rules of x and y you can take the one this is the one parameter group of x you can reverse the rules of x and y if you want to write y brackets you can take the one parameter group of y and do this and an interesting corollary of this is the yeah the proof of this what you do for this proof of this is the case take the case when x p is not 0 then you can think of it as d by dx and then you know what exactly the one parameter group is you can apply it to a vector field and see what happens it's, a, it's by simply translation and then it, so it, this formula is easy to check when at points p where x p is not 0 now take the set of points where xp is 0 take the interior of that that means it's an open set in which the vector field is identically 0 in which case both bracket xy and d by dt of phi t of y become 0 so true bracket xyp equals this where xp is not 0 it's equal to equals this uh, and when now take the points let b be the set of points where x p p such that x p is 0 then if you look at the v interior that is an open set in which <coughs> the vector field is identically 0 and when the vector field is identically 0 means the one parameter group has to be constantly 1. Constantly, the, the identity map. Actually, we work with analytic vector fields. So, the set of points where xp equals zero, if it is, <coughs> if that set is open, if that set has non-void non interior, the vector field is everywhere zero. So, principle of analytic continuation will apply. But anyway, even this whole thing will work in the C infinity situation as well. So, if set of points where in the V interior, therefore, the, the formula holds it holds on the open set where it is not 0 which u is the set where p x p is not equal to 0. It is true on u it is true on v 0 and if you take the u union v is the whole space and in that u union v interior is dense. So once on a dense set the two sides coincide they coincide everywhere because both sides are continuous functions of p. So that is how this statement is proved. I mean, I am going to be very sketchy about these things, but because I want to get down to regroups as quickly as possible. Now, maybe at, at the next, I know we will talk about yeah, one more thing I have to say here. If x and y are vector fields, they are said to commute if bracket xy 
is 0 because uh, in my definition of vector field you remember it is x y minus y x is the way it was defined. X, so take x into y minus y into x. So x y vector fields x y commute that is the definition if bracket x y is 0. And then we have the following lemma if bracket x y is 0 phi t x composed with phi s y is phi s y composed with phi t x that is the corresponding one parameter local one parameter groups commute with each other. Of course, I have to the right and left hand side have to be both defined which is happens only if s is sufficiently small etc. So, the reflection the fact the fact that x and y commute as vector fields is reflected in the fact that the corresponding local one parameter groups commute with each other. <coughs> okay, these are the proof of the things I want to say about analytic manifolds. Now I now get down to Lie groups. I have already defined a Lie group G. It's a group plus analytic manifold structure on G making such that the group multiplication M G cross G to G. This is a, in a natural way an analytic manifold, the product of two analytic manifolds analytic and I want to claim, I want to say that this is, this map is analytic as also the map G going to G inverse of G into itself. Actually the second condition is a consequence of the first as can be shown by using the inverse function theorem or rather implicit function theorem. It can be deduced from the implicit function theorem. Once this is analytic, oh yeah of course uh, you also use the fact that there is an identity in the group. So you can calculate the tangent map which will be useful in applying the implicit function theorem to conclude this already implies the second condition. But anyway for our purposes we can assume that both conditions are satisfied. So that is what a Lie group is and on a Lie group there are going to be some natural vector fields automatically. How do I get them? <coughs> okay, a vector field, how do I get a vector field? Suppose I fix, we fix a tangent vector V at the tangent space to G at the identity element which I will sometimes denote by 1 sometimes E. I take the tangent space at the identity which is which I have been denoting by T1, uh, 1 is the identity element T1 at G. <coughs> now if I fix a tangent vector at any, now look at consider the analytic map Lg going from G to G where G itself is an element of G defined by setting Lg of x is G times x. So, it is left translation by G. I take an element G in G, I, I can left translate by that element to get an analytic diffeomorphism of G on G, the inverse being L of G inverse, left translation by G inverse is the inverse of the left translation by G. <coughs> so, you find that this enables you to define at, at a point at G a new tangent vector, namely you take the tangent vector at 1, namely V, it is a tangent vector at 1 to G 
apply LG, differential of LG to this, you get a tangent vector at the point G. So define for G in G, define a vector field on G as follows. For G in G, vector field, uh, you give it a name, P tilde. V tilde at the point G, vector field, we must get a tangent vector at the point G to be DLG, the differential of the analytic map LG. I, I apply it to the vector V, which is the tangent vector at 1. This is in T1 of G. So, DLG will carry this into the tangent vector at the point G. So, this is a, this is easily checked. Analytic is an analytic vector field. It comes out of the fact that the multiplication is analytic. From that, it follows that DLG of V is <coughs> an analytic vector field, this defines an analytic vector field. And then it is also clear that the mapping which takes V to V tilde G is an isomorphism. of the vector space T G on the set of left translation invariant vector fields on G. Notice that V tilde, LG of V tilde equals V tilde, like LH if you like, for every H in G. That is what I mean by left translation invariant. It is invariant under the left translation by any element H in G. <coughs> the point is that V tilde, you just have to check that V tilde G when you left translate by LH you end up in V tilde at G. That is the kind of thing that happens. So, so set of uh, next observe that the set of left invariants, left translation invariant vector fields. Form a least subalgebra of the vector of the Lie algebra of all vector fields. The point is that if you have two vector fields x and y, which are left translation invariant, then bracket x y is necessarily left translation invariant because a diffeomorphism from an analytic manifold to another manifold takes vector fields to vector fields and brackets of vector fields to brackets of vector fields, which is obvious. So, LG being a diffeomorphism, we know that uh, LG, <coughs> you take two vector fields x, y, if they are invariant under, if both of them are left translation invariant, then we know that LG x, LG y, the bracket of LG x and LG y is same as LG of bracket x, y. But LG of x is x and LG of y is y. If x and y are left translation variant. So, it is clear that x g is a least subalgebra of the vector field. You know the definition of least subalgebra is obvious. It is a subspace which is stable under the bracket operation. So, you find that the set of left invariant, left translation invariant vector fields form a Lie algebra in their own right. I mean, it is a Lie subalgebra of something bigger, but it is a Lie algebra in particular. This Lie algebra is called the Lie algebra of the Lie group G. I will denote this
the set of the new algebra of left translation invariant vector fields is the Lie algebra of G, it is denoted with a German Gothic lowercase letter G. Yeah, whenever I, you know, I will always mention what this how this letter is pronounced because you know in, in my own uh, uh, student days some of these books had these things in gothic letters and so on I, I didn't know how to read them which is very annoying but <laughs> since then i have insisted i always tell people how to pronounce those letters this is g gothic lower case Okay, so that Lie algebra is denoted G. Sometimes also I'll write Lie G. This will be the case when I use a letter for the Lie group for which I don't know the Gothic version. In which case I'll use I'll use Lie G. <coughs> okay, so the Lie algebra of left invariant vector fields is Lie algebra G denoted Lie algebra of G and so on. And then, so if I take X, one can do the whole thing with uh, right translation invariant vector fields. But it makes no big difference because the mapping X to X inverse of G into itself takes left invariant vector fields into right invariant vector fields. And it gives an isomorphism of the corresponding Lie algebra. Lie algebra structure is the same. So we will always work with left translation invariant vector fields. <coughs> One might equally well do it with right invariant, but I am used to using left invariant vector fields and I will do that. Okay, and then you have uh, now suppose x is uh, an element of Lie G, <coughs> then you have corresponding one parameter group. Local one parameter group. at say identity, which means that is your phi t x going from an open set u to g, u defined for mod t less than delta and u open neighborhood of 1 g. We have that map phi t x. Now, you can also if you take a, some other point, say ug, and then you have there again a one local one parameter group phi tx from gu to g. I mean, this x is defined at all the all the points. You also have mappings like this, again defined for mod t less than delta. A priori, it's not clear that you need to, you can have the same delta for both. And this, and this as a translate, but this is clear because what you can do is that you notice that uh, the vector field G X is the same as the vector field X. Left translation with L D L G X equals X. So, under the diffeomorphism L G X goes to X, which implies that the one parameter group of L G X which is easily seen to be <coughs> apply LG inverse then phi t x this at 1 and come back by LG. So it, this will take a neighborhood of G into a neighborhood of 1 and then you can phi t x will make sense there and then you can go back by LG. It is easy to see that the one parameter group of LG, LG x is nothing but this. Both of them satisfy the same initial value. I mean, they are the same differential equations with the same initial value, the two sides, 
from that uniqueness of difference you can tell you this. So, one parameter group of LGX is equal to LG, which implies, which shows that, the, but that this on the other hand is same as that of X, which is phi T X after all, which means left translation by LG commutes with phi T. Left translation by LG commutes with phi T, the one parameter group phi T, which is now the one parameter group is defined for all G and it to, to come LG phi T LG inverse equals phi T is what we know because again LGX equals X. So, this the two vector fields are the same one parameter group, the two vector fields are identical they are for the same one parameter group, which means that this diffeomorphism phi T X commutes with all left translations. In a group if you have an operation which, which is a theoretic mapping of a group into itself which commutes all left translations, it has to be a right translation, there is no other choice. LG X for any x you want to take, but that you want to, uh, you are going to assume that it is going to commute, so it's sorry, you have phi of x, so you have phi t of x and I, I know that LG of phi t of x is equal to phi t of LG x. What does that mean? <coughs> this means g phi t x equals phi t g x. Now, Suppose I, I want to claim that uh, phi t x I want to claim is nothing but right multiplications by some fixed element x g t is what I want to say. If this happens I want to say it is this. In a group if you have a map of the group into, of it, into itself which commutes with all the multiplications then it has to be a right multiplication because you see what happens to the identity. So, you, the, you have e goes to some x a. Then what happens? G e will go to g x because the two things commute. But then this means every g is multiplied by a fixed x. So, it is a right multiplication. So, every phi t is a right multiplication. I will write phi t of uh, <coughs> g therefore, phi t of any g equals g times multiplication on the right by some element which I will call exponential t x. Phi t g has to be exponential t x for some t x exp where x t x is an element in g. Sorry? What? How L H acting on the vector field? Which is acting on the vector field? Sorry. Capital L H. Capital A. Yeah. Um, Sorry. How capital L H acting on the vector field? The capital L H. Yes, the left transfer. Yes. Sorry, L H is a diffeomorphism, analytic diffeomorphism. So it will take vector fields to vector fields. So that means that is what is done here. Yeah, yeah, no, I, okay. It's the same thing as this, if you like. But I'll also write this as LH of wheat. Uh, image under a analytic diffeomorphism of vector field is also denoted by phi of that vector field itself. If phi is, sorry. <coughs> so what has happened is this: you find, therefore, there is a. So, what all this leads to is that to get a map which I call exp from ah. So, so now also, the point is that once it is defined at all points g for mod t less than delta, it gets defined for all t in R because uh, last time I said that it is if it is defined, if you have phi t defined from all of g to g for mod t less than delta, then you can write any element x in R as n delta by 2 plus 
some psi where 0 less than root psi strictly less than delta by 2 psi in r. So, you can write anything in this and then I set for such an x phi x to be <coughs> phi delta by 2 raised to the power n composed with itself n times composed with phi psi. Phi psi makes sense because it is between 0 and delta by 2. So, the whole thing is phi t is defined for all t in r. So, in the case of left in vector fields well, this holds and that means we get a map from r cross the Lie algebra and once again from the uniqueness of the one parameter group which is same thing as the uniqueness solution and differential equations you find you have x t of s x is same as x t s comma x and we will define x from g to g as simply <coughs> x 1 x and it also follows that so x of 1 t x is same as x t comma x. <coughs> so, this is called the exponential map from the Lie algebra g to the group g. We have the following facts about the exponential map which are easy to prove using just the definitions. Firstly, x dx into x plus x equals x of t plus s. This is just the property of the one parameter group. Second property is the following if x if bracket x y is 0 then x t x x plus y equals x plus y x plus x. Once again the same statement we approved for one parameter group. So, if x and our vector fields which commute bracket x y is 0 then their corresponding one parameter subgroups also commute, local one parameter groups also commute, diffeomorphisms also commute. So, these are the important properties of the exponential map. <coughs> yeah, let me before we proceed give you the some important examples of what happens here. The simplest Lie group in some sense you can think of is an abelian Lie group or I mean if you like the simplest Lie group you can think of is the, the real line. R the real line is obviously a Lie group under addition. More generally, Rn is the Lie group. What is the Lie algebra in these cases? In the case of Rn, the tangent space at any point at, at the point 0 is Rn itself. So, the Lie algebra is Rn and the bracket operation is trivial. that is easy to check the bracket operation is trivial. <coughs> you how do you get the bracket operation you just have to take what are the left invariant vector fields. 
the d by dxi are all left invariant vector fields and they commute with each other and therefore the bracket operation is 0 left invariant vector fields all commute with each other so bracket x y is 0 in R n. So this is the Lie algebra. The Lie algebra is abelian if bracket x y is 0 for every x y in the Lie algebra. Obviously, for R n, the Lie algebra is abelian. <coughs> Actually, the converse is true. If G is abelian, then sorry, if, if the Lie algebra of a Lie group G is abelian. then G is a of a connected Lie group that is important. I mean if you non connected groups need this need not happen for a non connected group. If you take a Lie group which is abelian it is say R n cross some non commutative finite group that will still be a Lie group. The product with a discrete set with a manifold is again a manifold and obviously the multiplication will be analytic. And then of course, it is Lie algebra, it is Lie algebra of the connected component of the identity. So Lie algebra of a group is a really comes from the tangent space of the identity which is determined completely by the identity connected component. The neighborhood of the identity is already in, inside the connected component and there is a neighborhood. So <coughs> the group is the group need, if the Lie algebra is abelian, the group need not be abelian in general. But if the Lie algebra of a group G is abelian, then of a connected Lie group is abelian, then G is abelian. The reason is that if you look at the let us call the Lie algebra G, Lie algebra G of a connected Lie group. So, what happens is this you look at exponential x, x in a neighborhood of 0 in the Lie algebra. I told you already the exponential map is locally analytic diffeomorphism. This is a neighborhood of the 0 in G which maps home by the inverse, inverse function theorem you can see that a neighborhood of the 0 maps analytically isomorphically onto a neighborhood of 1 in G. So this is a x neighborhood is A neighborhood of 0 in G. If I take this to be connected neighborhood, then I know that exponential being a continuous map, the image is also connected. So, it is a connected neighborhood. Okay. And I know that uh, the Lie algebra is abelian, so we know that x t x x plus y or x x x x y the commutator in the group is 1 for every x y in G because the Lie algebra is abelian I can take the exponential images those elements will commute. This is the commutator in the group. Oh, incidentally I must have pointed out that x of minus x is x x inverse because x and minus x commute so x x into x minus x is x of x minus x etc. So you find that this maps into a neighborhood of 0 in G and this neighborhood of 0 it is a connected neighborhood take the group generated by it and group generated by an open neighborhood with identity is necessary to open subgroup. It is a subgroup first of all and then if you can translate by elements in the G the elements in the neighborhood. So you find that what, what I want to say is this the group generated by x x 
x in g contains an open subgroup. A group generated by this is first of all is connected and contains open subgroup of G. Now, in a topological group, an open subgroup is automatically closed because if you have no G is a topological group, say H is a open subgroup and then G breaks up into cosets following H. G mod, so, G is the union of cosets which are all disjoint and each coset is open because H is open, each coset is open. So, every one of the, so it follows that the set is both open and closed because it's a disjoint union of, the whole G becomes a disjoint union of these open sets and each such open set is the complement of the rest of the open sets and is therefore closed. So, it is open and closed and our assumption that G is connected tells you that G must be the is an, contains open subgroup of G which is therefore closed, any open subset subgroup is closed. So, hence equals G because G is connected. So, you find that the exponential image of the Lie algebra G generates G itself and the exponential image we know is a generates a commutative group because x specs and x y commute for every x y in G because uh, for assumption that the Lie algebra is abelian. So, all this leads to the conclusion that Lie algebra is the, if the <coughs> Lie algebra G of a connected Lie group G is abelian then G itself is abelian. And more we have in fact the fact that the mapping exponential if G is abelian we have exponential x into exponential y equals exponential x plus y. This is again easy to prove, I did not really go through the proof there, but it is quite easy to prove. <coughs> Notice that if you put a extra t here and here, you are going to get a x of t x plus y. So, both sides once again you see both sides are the same differential equation. So, it is the same initial value is the kind of thing you have to prove here. <coughs> so, we have expect that means that is x from g treated as a Lie group treated as the Lie group Rn to G is a surjective homomorphism. Because we know exponential is a homomorphism, the image is an open subgroup, therefore, we know that the image is contains an open label to the entity, therefore, the image is an open subgroup and therefore closed and therefore must be equal to all of G. So, G to G is a subjective homomorphism and so it is a subjective group homomorphism which implies that G is isomorphic to G modulo L where L is a closed discrete subgroup of Rn. So, any connected abelian Lie group is necessarily the quotient of Rn by a certain discrete subgroup and here is a lemma, a discrete subgroup L of Rn is necessarily of the form sigma i equal to 1 to direct sum i equal to 1 to q <coughs> r e i where e i 
1 less than root i less than root q r oh sorry z are linearly independent over r vectors. So, there are there is some number of linearly independent vectors take the z what you will generate by them that is the discrete any discrete group is of that form for suitable E i chosen. I am not going to prove this. This is a good exercise <coughs> okay. It is not difficult I mean you know you have uh, most, most of you would have come across this uh, result that uh, if you take two <coughs> real numbers A and B which are linearly independent over Q then the M A plus N B is going to be dense in the real line. That essentially the proof of that statement is equivalent to this. It, there are of course more variables involved one proves it by induction. One starts with fix some you have a subgroup L uh, which is uh, you fix some vector there such that no rational multiple of the vector so, sorry any any rational multiple of the vectors which is in L is already an integral multiple you fix such thing and then take the one dimensional subspace generated by this pass to the quotient and apply some kind of induction and then you get this result. In particular if G is a compact abelian group you find that G is necessarily the form R n modulo Z e i with i equal to 1 to n. If you do not have n linear independent elements the quotient is not going to be compact because this if it is Q linear independent it already generates a subspace which is of lower dimension and you are quotient by the by the discrete subgroup is is uh, is covered uh, covers a quotient by the vector subspace quotient by the vector space is non, non compact therefore this will also be non compact so if you want compactness you have to get q equal to m so the only compact So, this is the first statement about compactly groups I am making. So, if G is a compact Billion Lee group, compact connected a Billion Lee group, then G is isomorphic, the circle group is 1 taken product of the circle group take some n times for some n integers. <coughs> Why it is because as I said the E i will have to be a basis for the entire vector space and then you can take it as a standard basis by taking a linear transformation which will take standard basis into this basis and then you know that so you get so g is isomorphic to r n by z n which is clearly circle group I will also denote this s 1 n and call it the torus n dimensional torus is the product of the circle group with itself n times. So, any compact connected abelian Lie group is going to be a torus. So, that is our first so I am now embarking on <coughs> compact Lie groups, but before that I, sh I should have said something else which I should yeah. I associated to any Lie group a Lie algebra a finite dimensional Lie algebra. There is a process by which you can go backwards to that and before I say that I must explain something else a notion of I do not know if I defined this or not sub manifolds 
of an analytic manifold. A sub manifold of an analytic sub manifold analytic manifold M is a pair consisting of Yan comma I consisting of an analytic manifold Yan and an injective analytic map I going from Yan to M inclusion. So, this has been injective analytic map such that the differential of I d I at any point Yan or P from the tangent space to N at P to the tangent space to I P at I P to M is injective. In other words, using the inverse function theorem one sees that take a point in P and take a neighborhood, that neighborhood you will, you will have a coordinate system in, in a small neighborhood here so, and a coordinate system in the near the image point in M such that this for this small neighborhood the inclusion to the corresponding neighborhood both are coordinate charts is like the inclusion of some number of coordinates into all coordinates the other coordinates becoming 0. It simply becomes a hyperplane in a bigger space locally. <coughs> so, that is what an analytic manifold is. For instance, obviously Rm and Rn you have inclusions m less than Tn will give you an analytic submanifold. But some care has to be exercised because the topology on the manifold n induced from that on m is not necessarily the analytic topology on analytic manifold topology on n. The kind of phenomenon that can happen is the following. You have you can have a say something like the Leibniz of Bernoulli, but think of it as starting from this point going around and you do not you know the two things intersect here, but avoid the intersection point. So, it will be if you look at this kind of thing, it will be a mapping of some 0, 1 going into this. The point 0 is probably here and you go around sorry it is not, it's not so it's the point 0 is here say 0 starts like this and goes on and then the point 1 is this end point here. So, you take the open 0 1 you can map it into this limit scale of Bernoulli like this only this part. So, if you take this point here this is a this is the sub manifold clearly n is this 0 1 and you are looking at the whole thing in R 2. Look at this point its neighborhoods will contain intervals on this portion as also some interval in this portion. So, the, that is not like an interval in 0 1. So, the topology induced on 0 1 has neighborhoods of a different kind from the standard neighborhoods of this point 1. So, the topology is not induced topology, but the way the thing is done the tangent space map is well behaved and it is 1 to 1 I am avoiding n point 0 and 1. So, but this point is still there and therefore, at that point the topology is different whether you take the induced topology or the topology on n it is different. Another example which is uh, of interest to us in many situations is the following take the map from R to T 2 which is S 1 cross S 1 namely the map T into e power i t comma e power i alpha t alpha 
irrational. Then the mapping is injective. T if e power i t e power i alpha t equals e power i t prime e power i alpha t prime, it is clear that the t and t prime must be equal. Okay. And the differential map is easily calculated to be injective again. Already in one factor, this d by dt is already go, it will go into, it will have two components, but either component is going to be non zero. So, this is a submanifold. On the other hand, this is induced topology is not the topology here because if you look at Z, uh, yeah, look at the subgroup Z. In R, in the standard topology, it is a discrete thing, it is a closed subset. But if you look at the induced topology, it is going to be, you know, the topology, it is going to be in the induced topology, Z is going to be dense in R because e per i t e per i alpha t this is going to be dense in S1 cross S1. And this is the well known theorem that this is dense as the well known theorem I already stated, it is essentially due to Kronecker. <coughs> there is a more general version for the n dimensional torus, but I, I will not go into it. So, these are examples which show you that the submanifold need not inherit the topology of the ambient manifold. Nevertheless, there are many good situations where it does happen that the topology is the induced topology. <coughs> okay. Why am I saying talking about submanifolds? The reason is the following. There are two fundamental theorems in D theory about Lie groups. The two theorems I want to state are the following. The first theorem is due to Karta, e can, Eli Karta, which says that if H is a closed subgroup of Eli group G, then H has a natural structure of a Lie group. such that H i H to G, H is a subgroup of all, so there is an inclusion i H to G is an analytic submanifold of G. Moreover, the topology, the manifold topology on H is the same as the one induced from G. A closed subgroup has a natural section analytic manifold. The closeness is a purely topological assumption. There is no clear, it is not clear at all that there is going to be a manifold structure on it. It is not even clear it is a topological manifold, but what we are asserting is it is a natural structure of an analytic manifold such that the inclusion i h to g is an analytic map whose differential to every point is injective. It is an analytic submanifold means all that. And in this particular case, when it is a closed subgroup, this analytic manifold structure is such that the topology induced from g is the topology of which exists on h already as an analytic manifold. This theorem is due to Karta. And this second theorem, which is due to Lee, it is essentially called the fundamental theorem of Lee theory. It says the following. See, if you have a, yeah, <coughs> oh, if, before I say that, if you have a Lee group and suppose you have a Lee subgroup, then you have the tangent it says H is a least subgroup of G say, then the tangent map at identity from H to tangent, to tangent space at identity to G is obviously an injective map and this is actually 
is easily seen to be linear algebra homomorphism. So maybe I should state that first before I state the fundamental theorem. If H to G is a <coughs> Lee subgroup of a Lee group. I defined a Lee subgroup, right, didn't I? Yeah, or did I not define a Lee subgroup or did I? No, I did not. Okay. <laughs> sorry. In fact, I have stated here, yeah, sorry. Let me let me state what a Lee subgroup is first. A Lee subgroup of a Lee group G is a is a Lee group H and an analytic homomorphism. I analytic group homomorphism I H to G such that H comma I is an analytic submanifold of G. So Cartan's theorem tells you that if you have a closed subgroup, it is actually a Lee subgroup. It has a structure of a the subgroup H as a structure of analytic manifold. It is like this, and the inclusion is an analytic map. It's one to one. And <coughs> I've said it's an analytic submanifold, which is exactly what this is. So that's what a Lee subgroup of a Lee group G is. <coughs> if you have Lee subgroup, obviously you have a mapping d i differential of i from the uh, tangent space at 1 t 1 of g t 1 of h to t 1 of g. This is the Lie algebra of h and from this to the Lie algebra of g we have a linear map. This is a vector space homomorphism, so vector space homomorphism. The point is that in this situation d i 1 is a Lie algebra Home office. Once again, the proof is simply using the uniqueness of the differential equations business. You take the one parameter subgroup H here, which is like exponential Tx, look at its image. The point is that, that I should have said this also. See, it, it becomes as by the by because I is a submanifold. This is a submanifold means it's an injection, and it's a group homomorphism. So automatically, H becomes a subgroup. It's like group homomorphism. Yeah, I H is a subgroup. Therefore, oh, okay. I H can be identified with I H, and it's a subgroup. I use and I say I submanifold. It's injective. It's injective homomorphism. The image is a group because I, it's a group homomorphism. So I H which can be identified with H and can be thought of as a subgroup of G. But it has an analytic manifold structure which is assumed and then I have this map and then I have a map of the Lie algebra of H into the Lie algebra of G. This is a Lie algebra homomorphism. Why? Because once again the point is that if G to H or H to G is an analytic group homomorphism then for every X in H the Lie algebra of H U of exponential T X 
is same as exponential du of tx. Again, this is a consequence of our uniqueness theorem for the differential equations governing exponential tx. Exponential tx as a function of t satisfies a certain differential equation and then you can look at u of exponential tx that will you can see that immediately satisfies certain differential equations here and exponential du tx also satisfies the same differential equation with the same initial values and so on. So that happens that shows that this mapping preserves the bracket operation di1 has to preserve the bracket operation because I have defined the bracket operation if you remember I have shown that the bracket operation can be defined as d by dt of phi t of phi t x on y d by dt at t equals 0 use that fact and use the fact that you have u of exponential t x etc. So this implies d i here d u at 1 which is mapping of h to g is a real algebra homomorphism. So <coughs> du1 is a real algebra homomorphism in particular it will apply to this this inter i di1 is a real algebra homomorphism. I will sometimes denote this du1 also by so notation du1. So it will be i1 here. So Lee algebra homomorphism. Sorry? Injective. Oh, it will be injective here, not necessarily there. U is arbitrary there. I have not said U is injective there. U is a homomorphism, then there is a Lee algebra homomorphism. But if u happens to be uh, make, making h into a sub analytic submanifold, then of course it, du is injective and therefore this is injective. Okay. So what I proved is that the, what, what I stated here is the Cartan theorem which tells you that if you have a closed subgroup, it has a, automatically a structure of a Lie subgroup, Lie subgroup. The corresponding tangent space to h will, will be the Lie algebra of h and there is an inclusion etc. Now, one can in some sense go in the opposite direction that is given a Lie algebra we have seen that if there is a Lie subgroup there is a Lie subalgebra. You can go in the opposite direction given a Lie subalgebra you can construct a Lie subgroup. This is called the fundamental theorem of Lie theory and that is due to Sophus Lie. Sophus Lie is the originator of Lie theory that is why the whole thing is called Lie groups because named after him. So, but I think I will postpone the proof the statement of the least theory to the last time because I am already gone past 525. So next time we will talk about the first thing I will do is to talk about the fun, so called fundamental theorem of I will not even state it this time but it is called fundamental theorem of the theory which associates to every least subalgebra of a least subgroup of a, of a Lie subalgebra of the Lie algebra of a Lie group, a certain Lie subgroup of the original group G. So let me just Lie subalgebra of a Lie group of, of the Lie algebra of a Lie group from this you get a corresponding thing a Lie subgroup of G. This Lie subgroup will have this Lie subalgebra. If I call this H, I am going to get there is such a correspondence. I will make it more precise next time. We have already seen that from a group you can go to the Lie algebra if you like. That is a functor from the category of Lie groups into the category of Lie algebras. Now I kind of want to go in the opposite direction. You cannot do it fully. It is only a partial result. You can only go back partially and that is the fundamental theorem of Lie theory. Next time I will say something about the fundamental theorem of Lie theory and that would be my green signal to pass on to compact Lie groups proper. <coughs> I have to 
use some theorems from the, the fundam basic two theorems of Lie the theory, I will have occasion to use. And I will also, from the next time on, I am afraid I will have to use some topology, some uh, well known theorems in topology, which I will simply state without proof and use them freely. There are uh, ways of dealing with Lie groups without those topological theorems, but they are much less elegant. If you, there are many things happen. One of the most important things that happens is that if you have a compact connected Lie group, it, it contains a maximal toral subgroup, maximal subgroup isomorphic to your torus, such that every element is a conjugate in that. And once you have that, the character of a representation is known if you know it on the torus, because every element is a conjugate in the torus, and the character is the function which is invariant under is stable, is, say, is, is constant on conjugacy classes. So, the ultimate aim in representation theory is to classify representations and be able to write down for every representation, irreducible representation, the corresponding character. And for that, you need this fact that you have a maximal torus. So, if you know it on the maximal torus, you know the character. And unfortunately, to get the conjugacy of every element being in the maximal torus, you need some topological results, which I will state and use. It is actually the proof without the topological results is much more cumbersome and not so elegant. With topology, it becomes much more elegant. <coughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope uh, things are intelligible. I'm not going uh, well. Some point there are some uh, tutorial needed. Maybe one of us could run some more. So I can find the proof of this. Ah, any standard uh, book on Chevalier's book, for instance. Uh, actually, I don't know. Um, any any book on Lie groups uh, will have uh, any introductory book on Lie groups will have these two theorems. The usual thing is to state the, the usual thing they do is to first state the fundamental theorem of Lie theory, and then prove Cartan's theorem. Uh, state and prove this, and then prove Cartan's theorem. But you can reverse roles, but that is you won't find that in literature. I, I have a proof along those lines, but maybe sometimes I will pass on. Uh, some uh, written notes I have which I pass on for you to take a look. What does it mean for a topological group? Close subgroup of a topological group. It is a close subgroup. What can you say? So there is no, the ambient group is not even, a, it is not a manifold. What do, how are you going to talk of a submanifold or some, anything? In topological manifold. Well, if the, it is a theorem that if you have a group which is, underlying space is a topological manifold, it has an automatically a Lie group structure. And then of course, a closer group will be a Lie group. That is, uh, there is a famous, uh, one of the famous Hilbert problems, it is called the Hilbert's fifth problem, in which, uh, is it fifth or fourteenth, fifth, fifth problem, in which if uh, asked if there is a topological group with a certain number of conditions, uh, which will be satisfied if the group is a, if the underlying topological space is a manifold, whether such a group is automatically a Lie group. And the answer was the affirmative was first given by Gleason. Anyhow, uh, yeah. So the question makes sense only if you already have a Lie group. In, uh, any extra structure, you have to assume that the ambient group has, has that structure. Only then you can hope to get something similar. <coughs>